Hello, everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. As always, I hope you'll enjoy this live legal education content, and today will be the day I earn that subscription. For today's story, we are talking about Oberlin College in Ohio. Yes, perhaps one of the wokest universities in the United States. And of course, that is saying something. They're right up there with Evergreen State of Brett Weinstein fame. If everyone remembers that, they're in that territory of wokeness, where the wokeness has really taken hold. Well, the wokeness is costing them. So get woke, go broke to the tune of $31 million. In relation to things the university did, facilitated, encouraged, as it relates to the harassment of a bakery. So there is a bakery that is a private bakery that had done business with the university for many, many years. And they caught a black person stealing from them, right? They caught them stealing. And, you know, they were upset about that. And then the school said, well, it must be racism because this, the white, because the white shop owner said the black person was stealing and it's racism, but he was stealing. It, it, it was stealing. And so they made up all kinds of shit and all kinds of things. And it was a thing and the, the schools, the business was hurt and the people were harassed and all kinds of things. And the, the, the people were damaged to the tune of $31 million or more precisely $25 million plus $6 million in attorney's fees. Because yeah, it was that kind of case. So this has gone now to appeal and the court of appeal says get stuffed. So we're gonna review the get stuffed decision and you know, this could uh, potentially be the downfall of Oberlin College. I don't know that they have $31 million. So maybe this is the end of Oberlin. One can only hope, but let's stick with what we do now and just stick with a decision from the court of appeals in the great state of Ohio, as it relates to Gibson Brothers, the bakery, versus Oberlin College, the college. Let's get started with this. All right. The appellants, Oberlin College and its Dean of Students, Meredith Ramondo, appeal a judgment from Lauren County Court of Common Pleas that entered judgment against them and award compensation and punitive damages. So maybe it was 25 in compensation and six in punitive. Maybe that was what it was instead of the six. Yeah, maybe that was the breakdown. Maybe I made a mistake there. We'll get back there. Uh, the Gibson's cross appeal, the trial's reduction of claims and the court affirms. This case has a lengthy history including more than one year of pre-trial proceedings, an almost six-week trial, a separate trial on punitive damages, and several post-trial ru rulings. Although the case was initiated on November the 7th, 2017, so this is now five years in progress, with a 33-page complaint alleging numerous claims against each defendant, only three of those claims, which namely are libel, intentional interference with a business relationship, and intentional infliction of emotional distress were ultimately decided by the jury and remain at issue. The court recognizes that this case has garnered significant local and national media attention, and how. The primary focus of the media coverage and several amicus briefs filed in this case have been on an individual's First Amendment right to protest and voice opinions in opposition to events occurring around them locally, nationally, and globally. The court must emphasize, however, that the sole focus of this appeal is on the separate conduct of Oberlin and Ramondo that allegedly caused damage to Gibsons, not on the First Amendment rights of individuals to voice opinions or protest. Yeah, so as always, right, we need to look at the specific facts that are before us and the specific people that are before us. First Amendment interests are obviously important. The right to protest is important. The right to speak opinions is important. These are very worthwhile goals, but you can't libel. You can't interfere unlawfully with someone's business. You can't inflict emotional distress. Those are not protected First Amendment interests. So we're not trying to say anything about the First Amendment globally. We're just trying to speak to these people's particular conduct or lack thereof. 
So, you know, let's do that. All right, fine. When this case went to trial, the student protests were not a subject of this defamation case, but merely provide a background for how other potentially defamatory speech arose and was disseminated. So we're not talking about what the students necessarily did. We're just using that as background to help inform what other people did so that we have context. Moreover, as will be explained in much greater detail in this opinion, prior to allowing the jury to consider whether any written statements were actionable, the statements were reviewed by the trial court and will be again by this court on appeal under modern defamation law, which explicitly protects the First Amendment. Right. Yeah. Defamation is not protected by the First Amendment, but of course we have to make sure that this is defamation. The First Amendment generally prevents government from prescribing speech. However, our society, like other free but civilized societies, have permitted restrictions upon the content of speech in a few limited areas, such as defamation, which are of such slight social value as a step to truth that any benefit that may be derived from them is clearly outweighed by social interests in order and morality. Our profound national commitment to these free exchange of ideas and enshrined by the First Amendment, however, demands that law of libel carve out an area of breathing space so that protected speech is not discouraged. These are obviously balancing considerations. We need to make sure the libel law does not infringe on the protected speech and vice versa. Since the 1960s to provide greater protection to First Amendment rights to freedom of speech, the United States Supreme Court has narrowed the scope of traditional categorical exceptions for defamation, noting that actual categories of defamation are not within the area of constitutionally protected speech. This court begins by reciting facts relevant to this appeal, emphasizing that many of these facts are recited only for the purpose of providing the background under which this controversy arose. Again, Again, we have to only look to the people who are involved and their particular conduct. The other background facts are only here to help show the full context of their comments so that we can understand the full context of their comments because defamation law, as I'm sure many of you know, is context specific, both within the context of what the speaker is saying and other things, right? What is defamatory once in one sense would not be in another. Right? You can't just simply say a particular sentence or even group of sentences is defamatory. It depends on what else is being said. So context helps to inform our proper understanding of the entire context. All right. The Gibson Bakery is a bakery and convenience store located in Oberlin, close to the college campus. It has been run by the Gibson family for more than 130 years and is a long-standing relationship with the college, its students and employees, and the surrounding community. At the time of the controversy, the bakery was owned by Alan Gibson, often referred to during this litigation as Grandpa Gibson and his son, David Gibson. During this controversy, David's son, Alan Gibson, was an employee at the bakery but had no ownership interest. Young Alan is not a party in this case because, you know, not an owner. As stated in the testimony of current and former Oberlin administrators, Oberlin College is a private liberal arts college and conservatory of music that has been operating in Oberlin, Ohio since the 1830s. When this dispute arose, many Oberlin students have been protesting and otherwise expressing their dissatisfaction with treatment of people by their college in Ohio. The controversy in this case arose following an incident at a bakery on November the 6th of 2016. Although media coverage may have included other details about the incident, this court is confined to reviewing the record before us on appeal. As always, right, the, the Court of Appeals can only see what is in the record. There is nothing outside the record. Only what's in the record exists. We've discussed this before. Let me check and see if I had some text messages because it sounded like I did. Um... Anyways, yeah, so it, it, there is, um, yeah, so the court can only consider what's on the record before them. So whatever it might be in the media or otherwise, it doesn't exist if it's not on the record, and we've talked about that. 
According to testimony admitted at the hearing, three African American Oberlin students, one male and two females, were in the bakery while young Allen was working. Young Allen, I guess that's how we're going to be referred to him for the rest of this time. Young Allen later informed police that he confronted the male student because he believed the student was shoplifting wine and using a fake ID to purchase more alcohol. The male student fled the store and young Allen chased him across the street to apprehend and detain him for the police to arrive. When police officer responded to the scene, he observed that two female students also became involved in the physical altercation between young Allen and the male student. The police arrested the three students. The students eventually entered guilty pleas and were convicted for their role in the incident because they were in fact shoplifting. They, they were shoplifting. So yes, the three students, the one male and two females were engaged in a conspiracy to commit shoplifting at the store. And young Allen here, you know, decided to try to stop them you know, exercising what's called shopkeeper's privilege, incidentally, to try to detain them for the police. Which, you know, okay, you know, fair enough. That's one of the things that he might be able to do. Several college administrators testified that rumors about the incident at the bakery quickly reached members of the student body. Because many Oberlin students apparently believed the three students had been racially profiled by young Allen, they pled guilty. They announced that they planned to hold a protest outside the bakery beginning at 11 a.m. the following day. Although the record does not disclose details about who prepared the flyer, a one-page flyer was prepared to be distributed during the protest. The flyer urged a boycott of the bakery, asserting it was a racist establishment with a long account of racist profiling and discrimination. Emphasis in original. The flyer also gave an account of the heinous event involving owners of the establishment and stated that Alan Gibson had racially profiled the male student, improperly chased him out of the store, and assaulted him. Well, um, no, not so much with the racial profiling as he observed them committing shoplifting, to which they eventually pled guilty. So, not so much with the racial profiling as just, you know, observing these particular students who happened to be black were committing the shoplifting. But that won't stop the Oberlin College, which, you know, is running the wake, running, running for woke awards. Like if we're giving out Oscars for wokeness, Oberlin is right up there in the running with saying it's racist because of racial profiling and discrimination, even though it was, you know, none of those things. Raimondo, the, the president of Oberlin, learned about the planned protest shortly before it began. Early that morning, she met with other administrative and faculty members of the college and several of them attended the protest. The parties would ultimately dispute what role, if any, Raimondo and other college staff played in distribution of the flyer at the protest. It was not disputed, however, that Raimondo, as Dean of Students, attended the protests. Her testimony in the written policy of the college stated that Raimondo had responsibility to appear at off-campus student protests to attempt to maintain the peace. So Dean of Students slash President of the University was there at the protest for, you know, protesting a shopkeeper preventing the shoplifting. The testimony of the witnesses at trial indicated that 200 to 300 people demonstrated outside the bakery on November 10th and 11th of 2016. Although student protests are not the subject of the defamation claims at this stage of proceedings, the flyer that was distributed is central to this litigation. So again, not the student's protests, but the flyer specifically, which is making factual claims. The flyer and its distribution will be discussed in more detail in the court's disposition of the first claimed error of the trial court. The Student Senate held a meeting on the evening of November 10th and passed a Student Senate resolution. The Student Senate sent an FYE email, FYI email, with the Senate resolution attached to Raimondo, their faculty advisor, also the Dean of Students, and the then president of the college, Mar Marvin Kristoff. Okay, I apologize for calling Raimondo the president. Dean of Students and president are different roles at this university. I apologize. 
So just Dean of Students, second in command. That same evening, the student senate emailed the senate resolution to the entire student body. The student senate also posted the senate resolution in its glass display case at the student center at Wilder Hall, where it remained posted for almost one year. Because of the incident at the bakery and the claimed effort to appease the angry students, Ramondo testified she had instructed a subordinate to contact the college supplier of food for its dining halls, Bon Appetit, and tell them to stop or halt supplying the college with food from the bakery. There would be your tortious interference. There would be your tortious interference, All right? They contacted a supplier of theirs and told that supplier to stop doing business with the bakery, a third party, a third party, right? There's your tortious interference with contract. That would do it. Dean of students, hardly second in command of the president. Well, maybe your college is different than mine, uh, but Dean of students was second in command at mine. So maybe your college is different, but I, 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 I believe at my college, Dean of Students was considered second to the president. So uh, maybe that's just me though. Uh, anyways, one of the reasons I know that incidentally is for a period of time, like when the president was not, you know, when there was no president, the Dean of Students was acting president. So, I mean, it's just okay. Never much, never mind. Uh, anyways, carrying on. The parties dispute how long the bakery lost business from Armando's actions that interfered with the food order. They further dispute how much the bakery and Gibson's other businesses were negatively impacted uh, by publicity surrounding the flyer and Senate resolution. The Gibsons also owned two apartment buildings that provided off-campus housing for Oberlin students and others in the community, which the Gibsons alleged were also hurt by the actions of Oberlin. Oberlin and the Gibsons met a few times, but they sharply dispute what transpired during their attempts to resolve their differences and avoid litigation. For example, the Gibsons presented testimony that Oberlin initially had agreed to direct Bon Appetit to resume their dining hall orders, but only if Gibsons dropped charges against the three students and or gave students special treatment if they were caught shoplifting at the bakery, but the Gibsons would not agree to these conditions. So, you yeah, know, no. Oberlin witnesses denied even mentioning how they thought Gibsons should handle incidents of shoplifting at the bakery. The Gibsons also asked Oberlin to reach out to its students to explain the Gibsons had been falsely accused of a history of racial profiling and of assaulting the student. Oberlin witnesses did not dispute the Gibsons made this request, or that declined to comply with the request because it didn't want to further anger its students. Well, you know, there could be a problem there. The Gibsons also present evidence that members of Oberlin's senior ministry of staff had communicated via several text and email messages to express their anger about Gibson pressing charges against the students and their feelings the college should not work with Gibsons to resolve this situation. For example, the interim assistant dean was present in court on August of 2017 when Oberlin students were convicted for their role in November 2016 Baker incident. From the courthouse, she sent a text message to Ramondo, dean of students, stating, this is the most egregious process and I hope we rain fire and brimstone on that store. This is the most egregious process? Really? The, the guilties for the shoplifting? This is egregious? Really? Fire and brimstone? Okay. Ramondo responded by thanking the assistant dean for going to court to be with the students. Another example was a text message sent by Ramondo after the student newspaper published a letter from a retired Oberlin professor which expressed criticism of the college's handling of the Gibson matter. 
Raimondo sent a text message to another administrator that said, F him, I say unleash the students if I wasn't convinced this needs to be put behind us. You know, to, to the extent the university is unleashing the students, uh, there could be some responsibility there. Could be an issue. Joe says that they say they have an endowment of $1.1 billion. Well, yeah, then they probably won't be hurt very much by this, but if dreams come true, right? During the next several months, the Gibsons believed that they lost business and became the targets of what they perceived to be ongoing harassment by Oberlin and its students. They blamed Oberlin for repeated vandalism and property damage and for Grandpa Gibson breaking his back while investigating the source of someone pounding on his apartment door in the middle of the night. According to the Gibsons, they had suffered significant financial and emotional damages caused by the hands of Oberlin. The Gibsons filed this action, which ultimately proceeds to a jury trial. The jury entered verdicts for the Gibsons, individually and or the business, on their claims of libel, intentional infliction of emotional distress, and on their claim against Rebs Raimondo for intentional interference with the business relationship, for directing the whatever to not do business with the bakery. The jury also awarded attorney's fees and compensation and punitive damages, which were later capped by the court. Oberlin appeals raising three arguments as to error. The Gibson's cross appeal raising one argument of error. Okay, so we want to say that there were mistakes made by the trial court. That's what courts of appeal are for. Great. Let's analyze the purported mistakes of the trial court. Mistake number one. The trial court erred in denying motions for summary judgment and for judgment notwithstanding the verdict filed by Oberlin. That's going to be a rough road, right? I mean, you know, that's going to be a rough road. Summary judgment for Oberlin, even though they were ultimately found libelous or found found libel for it. And notwithstanding, it's like, you know, that's going to be rough. Oberlin's first argument as to error does not challenge the jury's verdict as being against the weight of the evidence. Well, you're already kind of screwed. Nor does it directly challenge the admission of any evidence at trial. Instead, the argued error is confined to the trial's court's denial of the motion for summary judgment and or judgment notwithstanding the verdict. But if the jury's verdict was not against the weight of the evidence, then why would the trial court grant a JNOV? The Ohio Supreme Court has held that any error by the trial court in denying a motion for summary judgment based on disputed acts is harmless if a later trial on the merits involving the same issue demonstrates there were disputed facts which results in a judgment. So, yeah, I mean, if the motion for summary judgment would be based like there's no facts in dispute that matter. If the trial shows, wait, there are disputed facts that matter, then how could it be in error, clear error, mind you, to not grant the summary judgment, which is predicated on there not being mistakes or not being disputes? I don't know. Any error in the denial of summary judgment became irrelevant after a jury decided the factual disputes based on a full presentation of relevant evidence. Therefore, the trial court's denial of the motion for summary judgment on grounds based on disputed facts is not a point of consideration. That that sounds right. I mean, they, they went to trial and ruled against them. So, I mean, how much can the facts plainly be in favor of Oberlin? I mean, unless, the, unless you think the jury went against the manifest weight of the evidence, but you're not arguing that, which makes it really hard. Yeah. The case law also emphasizes, however, that a decision was limited to a motion for summary judgment denied upon a finding there was a genuine issue of material fact, not upon purely legal questions, that were conclusively decided by the trial judge prior to trial. Right, 
you need to have facts in dispute in order to have a trial. If there are no facts in dispute, you don't need a jury. So you only need a jury if there are facts in dispute, correct. This court continues to have authority to review the denial of the motion for summary judgment on purely legal questions that were never presented to the jury for its consideration, such as whether the speech at issue was constitutionally protected. Fair enough, fair enough, because if, if the court was wrong on a purely legal issue, then there's nothing for the jury to do. Right. So if one, so one of the threshold questions for the trial court is, wait a second, wait a second, is this speech constitutionally protected? And there, there's a question of law in there about that, right? And so if the trial court says, no, this isn't constitutionally protected, but that's wrong, it is constitutionally protected, again, there's nothing for the jury to do. But it's because it made a wrong legal determination. So, right. If the, if, the, if the law gives you the answer, you don't need a jury. So sure, that makes total logical sense. Because Oberlin reiterated those legal questions in its motion for the JNOV, however, the court will confine its review to the arguments raised in the motion through the JNOV. Fine. It's not like the, it's not like the legal issues changed, presumably. I mean, how could they? So if the issue was preserved through the JNOV, sure, let's consider it as part of the JNOV, fine. JNOV is proper if upon viewing the evidence in the light most favorable to the non-moving party and presuming any doubt to favor the non-moving party, reasonable minds could come but to one conclusion, that is in being in favor of the moving party. As a motion for JNOV is decided as a matter of law, which it is because JNOV would be when the facts are such that only one side can possibly win. That's a legal conclusion. So yes, we will review it de novo. Fine. Through its lengthy motion for JNOV, Oberlin raises several arguments about why the claim should fail as a matter of law and argued that the matter should not have, proce should not have proceeded to a separate hearing on punitive damages. This court will individually address the arguments that Oberlin has properly raised through the alleged error, but will not reach the merits of arguments that Oberlin did not raise through its motions or legal arguments that it did not raise on summary judgment, as Oberlin cannot fault the trial court for failing to grant the motions not considered or forfeited. So, yes, as always, if you don't preserve it, you lose it, right? So we, as the court of appeals, are only going to consider those arguments that you gave to the trial court and properly preserved. So if you're gonna to try to come up with new arguments now, not so much, not so much. You have to give the trial court the opportunity to get it right. And if you don't give it to the trial court so they don't have it, the Court of Appeals is not gonna save your ass. Correct, you have to make all your arguments factual and legal to the trial court. If the trial court screws it up, great. That's what the Court of Appeals is for. If you screw it up, Sucks to be you. All right, libel. To establish defamation, the plaintiff must show that a false statement of fact was made, the statement was defamatory, the statement was published, the plaintiff suffered injury as a proximate result of it, the defendant acted with the requisite degree of fault. This should sound very, very familiar in sort of defamation. Different courts phrase it different ways with different factors, but this is basically the same thing. You know, you make a false statement of fact about someone to a third party, it's non-privileged, published, it harms their reputation, blah, 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 blah. You know the drill. Through their motion for JNOV, Oberlin challenges several aspects of Gibson's libel claims, and many of those challenges have been again raised on appeal. Oberlin asserts that Gibson's libel claims failed on first third and fifth elements listed above. The alleged libel statements were constitutionally protected opinion. That would do it if it's, if it's opinion versus fact. Opinions are protected, facts not so much. Oberlin did not publish the statements. If it wasn't them, then fair enough. 
Oberlin did not act with the requisite degree of fault. Okay, let's give that a shot. Oberlin attempted to defend against the libel claims by asserting that its students have a right to free speech and the protests and written statements were protected by the First Amendment. It was for the trial court to decide as a matter of law whether the statements alleged to be defamatory were protected or actionable. Oberlin has asserted throughout this case, as have several organizations through amicus briefs, that any liability for defamation in this case could have a chilling effect on students' right to free speech at colleges and universities. The court must emphasize, however, that Oberlin was granted summary judgment on Gibson's claims based on verbal protests by the students. Right, they're, they're, th those are the students' speech, right? Unless you can show something more to tie it back to Oberlin, the students' speech alone is not gonna do the trick. The trial court agreed the students' chants and verbal protests about Gibson's being racist were protected by the First Amendment and therefore not actionable. This is generally true. This is generally true. Broad statements like racist or white supremacist are generally speaking not actionable. So if you just say that someone is a racist or someone is a white supremacist without more, and generally speaking, that is not actionable. It's not considered a statement of fact. It's considered a statement of opinion without more. Now, if you, if you say they're a racist because of a particular thing or a white supremacist because of a particular thing, then you're making more of a statement of fact. But racist, white supremacist in the broad is generally speaking not actionable. By the time of trial, the Gibson's liable claim focused solely on whether Oberlin had disseminated false written statements of the fact that caused Gibson significant harm. That does seem to be the principal issue. Is it Oberlin the one that's doing that? That would be good. After the trial court granted partial summary judgment to Oberlin, the only potentially defamatory statements at issue were those contained in two documents, the flyer distributed during the protests and the Senate resolution, that'd be the student Senate resolution now, which was emailed to all members of the student body and posted in a display case at the student center. Okay. In determining whether a statement is defamatory as a matter of law, a court must review the totality of circumstances to determine whether a reasonable reader would interpret it as defamatory. The words should be considered within the context of the entire publication and the thoughts that the publication is calculated to convey to the reader to whom it's addressed. To determine whether the alleged defamatory statement is fact or opinion, we examine four factors. The specific language used, whether the statement is verifiable, that would be kind of important to determine whether or not it's fact or not, right? An opinion can't be verified. The general context of the statement and the broader context in which the statement appeared. You know, fair enough. Everything has to be understood in its own context. The flyer was a two-sided page. The front of the flyer began with a large font, bold face, don't buy printed inside a template of an eight-point star. Well then, that's a nice little detail. Okay. And included other pleas that people boycott the bakery and shop elsewhere. The back page of the flyer listed other local retailers for the students to find specific items. The libel claims focus on the following language on the front page of the flyer. This is a racist establishment with a long account of racial profiling and discrimination. Today, we urge you to shop elsewhere in light of particularly heinous events involving the owners of this establishment and local law enforcement. Please stand with us. Okay, racist establishment, probably not actionable. Long history of racial profiling and discrimination, actionable. That sounds like factual claims. Yeah. A member of our community was assaulted by the owner of this establishment yesterday. A 19 year old young man was apprehended and choked by Alan Gibson of Gibson's Food Mart and Bakery. The young man who was accompanied by two friends was choked until the two forced Alan to let go. 
After the young man was free, Alan chased him across the, across College Street and into Tanapen Square. There, Alan tackled him and restrained him until the police arrived. These th the three were racially profiled on the scene. Ten dollars from Mandalore Wise. Off topic, but I thought I remembered you mentioned a while back. The government claimed not to use a VPN. Meant the data is not privacy protected. Do you remember what you were referencing if it was you? I don't remember any such statement, and that doesn't sound right. So I can't really comment more intelligently. I am apologize. Um... The three were racially profiled on the scene. They were arrested without being questioned, asked their names, or read their rights. Now, friends, playing along, playing along at home, did the police do a bad based on this description? This is where you get to. This is where you get to play along at home. Did the police do a bad? They were arrested without being questioned, asked their names, or read their rights. Did the police do a bad by failing to read their rights? And the answer to the question is no, they didn't. This trope that the police read you your rights when you're arrested, it's not uncommon that they do it, but it's also not required. Miranda, the Miranda warning applies when two things are true custodial interrogation custodial interrogation you have to be in custody and they have to be asking you questions so if they were arrested without being questioned which is the premise then they were not they did not have to have their rights read to them at that time by law again not uncommon for it to happen but not required two were released shortly after and charged with assault the young man's being held in lorraine county jail charged with robbery no bail until his arraignment this friday 8 30 a.m 65 south main if you've been victimized by this establishment in any capacity, we ask you stand with us in support of our community member. The remaining, the remainder of the front page provided an email address for people to supply additional information or photographs. Yes, questions related to a specific crime. You can still be asked basic information. This is true. Yeah, you can still be asked like, name, address, that kind of stuff. That's true, without being read your rights. That's fair. Um, Senate resolution. The Senate resolution was passed by the Student Senate on November the 10th, 2016. It urged students to cease all support of the bakery and called upon faculty and administration of this college to condemn the treatment of students of college of color by Gibson Food Mart and Bakery. Rather than quote the resolution in its entirety, the court will summarize and quote the most relevant portions at issue here. The resolution begins with acknowledgement and condemning hatred and bigotry as well as all acts of violence. It then details a few key facts about the Gibson incidents because we find it important to share them with the Oberlin community. A black student was chased and assaulted at Gibson's after being accused of stealing. Several other students attempting to prevent the assaulted student from receiving further injury were arrested and held by Oberlin Police Department. In the midst of all of this, Gibson employees were never detained and were given preferential treatment by police officers. Yeah. Gibson's has a history of racial profiling and discriminatory treatment of students and residents alike. Oberlin has argued the flyer and Senate resolution contains only opinions but has focused its opinion throughout the case on statements alleging merely that Gibson's were racist. Despite Ogerlin's argument to the contrary, the potentially liable statements in this case include much more than calling them racist, which by itself is probably not actionable. Can I talk about victims and relief? That's way too broad of a question. I don't even know what that means. 
The trial court determined as a matter of law that both the flyer and the Senate resolution were not statements of constitutionally protected opinion, but were defamation per se. I mean, the resolution did say facts. A trial court focused on the statements about the Gibsons and their bakery, having a history of racial profiling and discrimination towards students and residents and a statement about an assault of a student by an owner or owners of a bakery. The flyer states that the bakery has a long account of racial profiling and discrimination and the Senate resolution states among its key facts that Gibson has a history of racial profiling and discriminatory treatment of students and residents alike. Those sound like facts to me. Statements that a bakery has a history or account of discrimination and racial profiling would be interpreted by a reasonable reader to mean there were past instances of discrimination or profiling. These statements can be verified as true or false by determining whether in fact there was a history or account of these events. Sure enough, the statements about assault of a community member based on racial profiling at the bakery were described as heinous in the flyer and described in both the flyer and Senate resolution to be unjustified under the circumstances. The trial court found the allegations of assault, if untrue, were defamatory per se, and Oberlin has not raised a timely or proper challenge to this ruling by the trial court. And then they say, although they now challenge it, that issue was not raised in the summary judgment. So that issue is gone, right? That issue is gone for failure to preserve it. Oberlin has also argued the statements in the flyer about a student being apprehended by Alan Gibson was a reference to young Alan, who was not a party to this litigation. So there was no potential libel against any party. The flyer did not identify Allen by his middle initial, however. Although also, the sense immediately preceding the first reference to Allen in the flyer states that the young man was assaulted by an owner of the establishment. Moreover, the first paragraph of the flyer referred to a particularly heinous event involving owners of this establishment. A reasonable reader would interpret this language to state the owners of the bakery assaulted the young man. I mean, yeah, fair enough, right? The trial court's conclusion that these statements were actionable factual statements was further supported by reading them within the context of the flyer and the Senate resolution and the broader context of the environment at the college, where students have been expressing ongoing dissatisfaction with racial injustice on campus and the community at large. These statements were published shortly after the incident at Gibson's, prior to the prosecution and conviction of the students, and before the actual facts had been flushed out. Given the path Given the public's lack of knowledge of what happened at the bakery and ongoing tension about racial injustice, these statements would convey to a reasonable reader that the arrest and alleged assault at the bakery were racially motivated. The Gibsons had a verifiable history of racially profiling shoplifters on that basis for years, and those facts were a reason to boycott the bakery. The trial court did not err in concluding as a matter of law that these were actual statements of fact, not constitutionally protected opinion. Consequently, did not err in denying the JMV on this basis. So that sounds roughly right. I mean, those do sound like statements of fact. They even are purported to be statements of the fact by the people making them who say that they're statements of fact. So, you know, when you say this is a fact, kind of goes a long way. For the 480 of you who are currently watching the stream, thank you very, very much for being here. I really do appreciate each and every one of you for being here and being part of this stream. If you're not subscribed already, if the if the red subscribe button is red, you are not subscribed, please click on it so it will stop being red, so you will be subscribed. And your super chats, as always, are generously appreciated as I continue to try to make this more of a full-time gig. Thank you. Okay. All right, so yeah. Next, Oberlin asserts, so those were as to whether or not they were facts. Yeah, I think that's, I think we're there. Those are all facts, I think we're there. All right.
Next, Oberlin asserts that Gibson's did not prove that Oberlin published either the flyer or the Senate resolution. Much of Oberlin's argument about whether Gibson's proved the publication is intertwined with an argument about the degree of fault the Gibson's were required to prove. Although fault must be proven at the time of publication, publication is a distinct element of the libel claim. This court will focus on publication review on whether the court erred in denying JNOV on the publication element of the libel claims. 99 cents from E.E. E. Caroline, thank you. Any act by which defamatory matter is communicated to a third party constitutes publication. As a general rule, all persons who cause or participate in the publication of libelous or slanderous matter are responsible for such publication. Hence, one who requests, procures, or aids and abets another to publish is liable as well as the publisher. Construing evidence before the trial court in favor of the Gibsons, as a motion for JNOV requires, reasonable minds could conclude that Oberlin published the flyer and the Senate resolution. Therefore, the JNOV basis would not be have been proper. We will review the evidence pertaining to publication on each of the statements separately. It is unknown from the record who wrote the flyer or who made the initial copies of it. Nevertheless, it is not disputed that the flyers were distributed during the protests outside the bakery. Moreover, the Gibsons present evidence that Raimondo handed at least one copy of the flyer to Jason Hawk, a reporter and editor with the Oberlin News Tribune. I mean, that would do it. Although Raimondo and other Oberlin witnesses dispute much of the evidence presented by Gibson on this issue, in our review, we must construe the evidence in favor of the Gibsons. Jason Hawk testified for the Gibsons. According to him, Raimondo saw him watching the protest and trying to take pictures. She walked over to him and identified herself by her name and role in the college. He told Raimondo that he was a reporter with the Oberlin News Tribune. She asked him if she'd already gotten a copy of the flyer, and because he had not, she asked the student to go get one for him. The student returned with a flyer, handed it to Raimondo, who then directly handed it to Hawk. Hawk later published more than one article in the Oberlin News Tribune that quoted parts of the flyer. And I don't know if that's my upstairs neighbor being salty or not, but, you know, we will deal on. The former director of security at Oberlin testified that he attended the protest to see what was transpiring at the event. He was handed a flyer by the students, but threw it away. He testified that another man, who identifies himself as being with the college, tried to hand himself a flyer, but he refused it. The former security director was later able to identify the man by his picture on the college Facebook page as associate director of Oberlin's Multicultural Resource Center. Although no one testified that Oberlin employee had been handing out flyers, other witnesses did testify that he had attended the protest. The former security director further testified that he saw the same man walking through the crowd with a stack of flyers. On cross-examination, Oberlin questioned whether he could read the flyers in the man's hand. The witness responded unequivocally, the same flyer because he could see the star album at the top that said, don't buy. As Oberlin professor testified, she was monitoring students during the protest when one of them asked if the students could place flyers on the windshield of the parked cars. She responded they could place the flyers on car windshield but advised them not to go into any private property. An employee of the bakery who was working during the protest testified that he observed Ramondo with a large stack of flyers and saw her handling smaller stacks of them to students to distribute. He testified that he also overheard Ramondo tell students that he could make more copies of the flyers in the conservator's office. An Oberlin employee who worked with the conservator's office that day testified that during the protest, students brought her flyers to make copies. She explained that she handed the flyer to her superior, who offered to make copies and walked it through the copy room. Although she never saw her superiors with copies of the flyer, he never told her that he didn't make copies of the flyer. She testified that she believed that he had made five copies of the flyer. Finally, the jury heard evidence about other actions taken by the Oberlin facility and administrators to aid the students. The college provided a room in a nearby building for them to take breaks during the protests. The college supplied 
coffee and pizzas in that room, and Oberlin agreed to reimburse the student for $75 to $100 that they'd spent on gloves so protesters would not get too cold. So, yeah. So, yeah, there, there you go for, like, aiding and abetting, contributing to, encouraging, extolling, and all the rest of it, right? To, to engage in this, right? So who knows who made the flyer? We're not sure, but we do have quite a bit of action from various employees of the university. We have the Dean of Students handing out a copy of the flyer to a reporter. We've got teachers making copies of it. We got teachers saying you can make copies in the conservatorship. We got we got the make off in coffee and pizza and spending money for gloves so the students wouldn't get cold and so forth and so on. Yeah. Five dollars from Mr. Hellspawn for Kurt to quit his job and become a happy camper fund. Great dude, keep it up. Thanks, ma'am. I appreciate it. Considering the totality of the evidence in favor of the Gibsons, a reasonable person could conclude that Oberlin took actions directly published and or assist in publishing. Yeah, I mean, that would do it, right? That they aided, abetted, encouraged, extolled, supported, financed. There is sufficient information to reach those conclusions, which is the question we're trying to reach right now, right? Because the jury could conclude the opposite, at least, you know, the jury could conclude the opposite. The jury could conclude, you know, that's not enough. You know, for, to, that's not enough of things. But they concluded it is enough things, and that will work. Um, nine ninety nine from Joshua Owen, low cash for the Texas bar costs. Nine ninety nine from Stephen Light. Agree, Mister Hellspawn. Well, thank you both very, very much. It was appreciated. On a purely personal note, I did my first elliptical. Well, I don't know if it's my first. It's my first elliptical in a while. I've been doing some working out and stuff, and I I needed to work on my cardio. And I did a mile on the elliptical today. My cardio needs help. But it was nice getting a mile in, and I'm going to continue working on the cardio and powering through, ma'am. Let's press on. E. e. Caroline says the college did not aid in a bet. It committed the act itself. It was no mere helper. Well, I mean, the facts are what they are, so I mean, okay. The Senate resolution. Although the jury heard less evidence about the active role Oberlin played in the publication of the Senate resolution, there is an important distinction between the Senate resolution and the flyer. Unlike the flyer, the Senate resolution was not distributed on the street by an unknown group of students to people who happened to walk by. The Senate resolution was written and published by an organization that was sanctioned by the college to govern its student body. The jury heard evidence that Oberlin assisted the student Senate in its activities by providing it with financial support, a faculty advisor, Ramondo, an office in the student center, and nearby a glass display case with which it could post announcements. More significantly, the college also provided the student senate with authority to meet and pass resolutions, distribute them to the entire student body via mass email, and display the resolutions in the glass display center in the student center. Also, the evidence at trial was undisputed that the evening the student senate passed the resolution. The senate sent a copy of the resolution to Ramondo, its advisor and then president, Krizov. Ramondo and Krizov did not respond about the content of the resolu resolution, and both claimed they were unaware that it was posted in the student center for nearly one year in the same building in which Ramondo had their office. Hmm. Hit the pool, man? Well, maybe when it warms up, I will. Uh, maybe I will hit the pool. This evidence about Oberlin affirming providing the student senate with various types of outward assistance could support a jury's conclusion that Oberlin facilitated the initial publication of the student resolution. But for Oberlin providing the student senate with means and authority to create and send senate resolutions to the entire student body via email and post it in a prominent display case in the student union to be seen by current and potential students, the senate resolution could not have been published in the manner that it was. The Gibsons also argued throughout the trial that Ramondo or the college should have stopped the publication of the Senate resolution by removing it from the display case 
sending a message to the student body and or otherwise calling upon the student senate to retract and correct the defamatory statements. Oberlin responded throughout these proceedings and no obligation to remove the resolution from the display case or take corrective actions regarding it. Oberlin cited no legal authority to support that argument, however, nor to present evidence at trial that lacked the ability to take the corrective actions. On the one hand, on the other hand, there is authority to support Gibson's position. In addressing similar issues, the 10th District determined the defendant could be held liable for not refu refu removing defamatory signs posted on our property. 1999 from Eddie Oliver. Hey, Kurt, did you see the grand jury refused to indict Kyle Kareth for the port shooting in Lubbock? I did. Chad Reed's wife said she's going to continue with the civil case. Okay. Can't wait to see where the Austin BLM shooting goes. Yeah. So... Slightly surprised, I think, uh, is my reaction that the grand jury didn't indict Kyle. Um, I wonder how hard the, the 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 prosecutor really tried, because there is that saying that you can you can indict a ham sandwich, and whether or not he would have been convicted, who can say in the end? But I, I guess slightly surprised that uh, there was an indictment, um, but because of how easy it is to get an indictment, that's why I'm surprised. Um, but yeah, I'm not surprised at all that they're going to continue with the civil case. So we'll see how it progresses, I guess. In wrestling with the issue, the court held that one who intentionally and unreasonably fails to remove defamatory matter he knows to be exhibited on land or chattels in his possession under his control is subject to liability for continued publication. Interesting. In reviewing the evidence in line with the law, there is evidence before the jury construed in favor of Gibson's that supported the conclusion that Oberlin knew the Senate resolution was posted in the display case in the student center for nearly one year, yet failed to take action to remove it. The evidence was not disputed that the Senate resolution was enacted on November the 10th of 2016, a copy was sent to Raimondo and the college then present the same evening, and the resolution was posted in the display case near the Senate office in student center until after Gibson filed their lawsuit. Oberlin presented testimony of Romando and others that no one in position of authority at the college knew the resolution was posted in the display case until after the lawsuit was filed because the complaint referred to the posting in the display case. The Gibsons present evidence, however, to question the credibility of Oberlin's witnesses about their lack of knowledge of the Senate resolution being posted. The student senate emailed an FYI copy of the Senate resolution to Romando and the college's then president. Both testified they were aware of the glass display case where the student senate posted announcements. Moreover, Ramondo's office was one floor up in the same building, and she was a faculty advisor of the student senate whose office was near the display case. Evidence was also admitted that the display case could be easily seen by students, prospective students, and parents, and other visitors to the student center. A reasonable jury could conclude that Ramondo and or the former president knew the senate resolution was posted in the display case. Shortly after the Gibsons filed their lawsuit, Romano asked members of the Student Senate to remove the resolution from the display case, which they did. A reasonable jury could also infer from that evidence that Romano, as faculty advisor, had authority and or obligation to instruct the Student Senate to remove the resolution many months earlier. Therefore, construing the evidence presented in favor of Gibsons, the trial court did not err in failing to grant the JNOV based on the publication of the Senate resolution. So. I'm a little less convinced on this cause of action, to be honest, um, in terms of this issue with student sentence, because this this student sentence having this kind of a power is not unusual at schools, and I, I'm not so sure about um, about a lot of this, to be honest. But then again, of course, this is a matter of Ohio State specific law, so at least the Court of Appeals says that's the law as it relates to this issue. I also wonder the degree to which this could be read to apply to public universities as well as private universities. So there, there are some questions there on the on, on my mind on this issue. Uh, with the flyer, with them making copies and distributing copies and offering to make copies, yeah, but the student senate seems a little bit too detached somehow for my money, for my taste. But maybe it's just me. It feels a little too detached. But I agree as, as to the flyer, so, you know. On appeal, Oberlin argues the trial court incorrectly found as a matter of law 
The Gibsons were not public figures or limited purpose public figures and should have granted the JNOV. Really? They're public figures? How are you getting to that? The status of the plans determines the degree of fault required. Because the trial court found the Gibsons were private figures, which they absolutely are, how are you getting to public figure? They were required to prove Oberlin acted negligently. Had the trial court accepted the argument they were public, they'd be required to prove malice. Yeah. One may be designated a public figure for all purposes by achieving per per pervasive fame or notoriety. As a court further explained, absent clear evidence of general fame or notoriety in the community and pervasive involvement in affairs of societies, an individual should not be deemed a public persona for all aspects of life. Yeah, general, general public authority is hard if you're not the government or a politician. The court rejected the argument that the attorney Gilbert was a public figure simply because he was a well-known attorney in the Akron legal community. Similarly, we cannot conclude the Gibsons became public figures merely because they ran a well-known business. Yeah, that's not going to fly. Not, not, not going to fly. A person may also become a public figure for certain purposes when he voluntarily injects himself or is drawn into a particular public controversy and thereby becomes a public figure for a limited range of issues. Oberlin argues the Gibsons have become limited purpose public figures because they voluntarily injected themselves into the controversy. Did they though? Did they really? Oberlin broadly defines the controversy in this case to what it be to what it alleges the history of racism at the bakery. Bakery. The proper focus of the inquiry, however, is on the controversy from which the alleged defam defamation grow, the incident at the bakery on November 9th. The Gibsons do not, did not voluntarily inject themselves into a shoplifting incident at the bakery, nor did they voluntarily inject themselves into extreme public criticism of an employee's efforts to apprehend and detain the shoplifter. Oberlin failed to demonstrate to the trial court, erred in concluding as a matter of law, they're private. They are totally private figures. Because Gibsons were private figures in the libel case, they're required to prove only they acted with negligence. I mean, yeah, that that much is they're they're private figures. That you need they then they just because you run a bakery doesn't make you a public figure. That's ridiculous. After the jury trial, judgment was granted on behalf of Oberlin, but against Romando on Gibson's claims for intentional infliction of emotional distress with a business relationship. Oberlin argued in his motion for JNOV that based on the evidence presented at trial, Raimondo should also have been granted judgment on this claim. The tort of inter intentional interference with business relationship and contract rights occur when a person without privilege to do so induces or otherwise purposely causes a third party not to enter into a continue, not to enter into or continue a business relationship with another or not to perform on the contract of another. That sounds a lot like what Romando did. The, interfer the interference, the inference, no, the interference must be by someone who's not a party or agent of the party to the contract or relationship. Oberlin argued that Gibson had no cognizable claim against Romando for tortious interference between Bon Appetit and the bakery because Bon Appetit was not a third party but was an agent of the college. Okay. Thus, Romando, as an employee of the college, could not tortiously interfere in a business relationship with another agent of the college because they were essentially a party to that relationship. Okay, that would work. Consequently, the sole dispute is whether Bon Appetit conducted business with the Gibsons as an independent third party or as an agent of Oberlin. Fair enough, if it is Oberlin, then they're just party to the contract. And so is Romando, so fair enough. 15 dollars from Dennis Heaton, thank you very much. Thanks for always for the informative videos. If the college pays in nickels, will the judge slap them around? Yeah, you're going to have to write a check. I mean, yeah.
Therefore, this court confines its review to an argument briefed by the parties. Whether Bon Appetit, the alleged agent, had authority to bind Oberlin, the alleged principal. Binding the principal to agency-made contracts typically requires the agent make the contract on the principal's behalf with actual authority. The restatement defines actual authority in terms of expression of intent. To determine whether a principal-agent relationship existed, the court should review the management agreement to determine in what way it defined the relationship between the two parties. A purchaser is not acting on behalf of a supplier in a distribution relationship in which goods are purchased from the supplier for resale. A purchaser who resells goods supplied by another is acting as a principal, not as an agent. Oberlin and Bon Appetit entered into a management agreement years earlier. Among other things, the agreement provides that Bon Appetit shall act as an agent for Oberlin in the management of food service operations. The parties do not dispute that this one statement referring to Bon Appetit as Oberlin's agent is not determinative of the agency issue. Okay. The Gibsons also point to a sentence in the same agency relationship paragraph, which provides that Bon Appetit shall purchase food and supplies in Bon Appetit's names and shall pay the invoices. This language indicates that Bon Appetit simply purchased goods from the bakery and resold them to Oberlin, acting as a principal, not as an agent. Nothing in the remainder of the 11-page management agreement indicates that Bon Appetit had authority to bind Oberlin to its business relationship with the bakery or any of its vendors. Consequently, Romando failed to prove that Bon Appetit acted as a purchasing agent, so she failed to demonstrate that they erred in the JNOV. I mean, all right, fair enough. The Gibson's final claim involves intentional infliction of emotional distress. To establish the claims for IIED, David and Grandpa Gibson were required to prove that the defendants intended to cause, knew or should have known, their actions would result in severe emotional distress. Their conduct was extreme and outrageous, going beyond all bounds of decency and considered intolerable in a civilized society. Their actions proximately caused psychic injury to the plants, and the plants suffered mental anguish beyond what a reasonable person should be expected to endure. Oberlin has argued the claims of David and Grandpa Gibson for intentional infliction of emotional distress were legally insufficient because the claims relied on the same constitutionally protected speech that formed the basis of the libel claims and that the alleged libelous statements did not rise to the level of extreme and outrageous conduct. The court has already determined in this assignment of error, however, the statements that formed the basis of the claims were not constitutionally protected speech. They were statements of fact. I think that much is true. The court calls him grandpa, they sure do. That is apparently the, what they've gone on. Moreover, the conduct at the issue at Gibson's claim for IIED included much more than statements in the flyer and the Senate resolution. The Gibsons presented evidence that despite the bakery's ongoing relationship with Bon Appetit, Oberlin abruptly told Bon Appetit to stop doing business with the bakery. In meetings between Gibson's and administration, Oberlin expressed a greater concern about appeasing its students than with repairing the Gibson's ongoing business relationship with Bon Appetit. According to the Gibson's, Oberlin would not direct Bon Appetit to resume business with the bakery unless the Gibson's agreed to drop criminal charges against the student shoplifters and or implement a policy through which they would not prosecute any first-time student shoplifters, but instead would give them a pass and contact the college instead of the police. The Gibsons presented several printed text and email messages between senior college administrators to demonstrate that nearly a year after the bakery incident, they did not believe the college should work with the Gibsons to resolve the situation. Oberlin's witnesses did not dispute the print messages have been communicated between the administrators. One text message sent by interim assistant dean expressed that criminal conviction of the three students was an egregious process and she hoped the college would rain fire and brimstone on the bakery. In response to a printed letter from a retired Oberlin professor who criticized Oberlin's response to the college situation with the Gibsons, Romano stated in another text message, F him, I say unleash the students if I wasn't convinced this needs to be put behind us. 
the Gibsons presented other messages that they communicate between senior administrators that also express lack of concern about the past and ongoing damages that have been suffered by the Gibsons. The Gibsons also present evidence that after Oberlin administrators had learned that student allegations of assault and racial profiling might be false, they directed Bon Appetit to resume business with the bakery. Oberlin denied the request of Gibsons, however, to correct the statements on the flyer or Senate resolution or otherwise work with students or community to restore or stop the ongoing damage to the Gibsons' reputation. Although Oberlin disputes much of this evidence, the trial court was required to construe the evidence in favor of the Gibsons because the jury had already returned a verdict, that's why. Also throughout this argument, Oberlin has challenged only the adequacy of the outrageous conduct alleged by the Gibsons, not whether they proved that Oberlin was responsible. A.D. says, $2, do victimless crimes violate the Sixth Amendment? No. The reason, the principal reason why victimless crimes do not violate the Sixth Amendment is that in all criminal cases, the victim is the state. Um, that's the party that is aggrieved. It's always the state versus, right? So it's like, yeah, um, they're the ones that are aggrieved. So yeah, this, the state is the aggrieved party. So now yeah, victimless crimes do not violate the Sixth Amendment. You have a right to confront your accusers, whoever they happen to be, as to whatever the uh, elements of the charge are. Romando threatened all of us in food service. We would get fired if we were seen supporting the Gibsons. Well, okay. I mean, that's bad. I don't know the degree to which that came out in trial testimony or not, but fair enough. V Sync, that is a bad take, man. The settlement will not be paid off taxpayer money because Oberlin is a private school. Yeah, I, I picked up on the fact Tiny Tonks work there. I, I picked up on that. I, I got it. Finally, Oberlin argues the trial court erred in denying motion for JNOV in that it should not have been allowed to consider an award for punitive damages in the bifurcated damages stage of the trial. Oberlin alleges that because the jury had already found no actual malice in the liability stage, it was improper to consider further punitive damages on liable claims. Oberlin cites no authority in support of this. Um, in a tort action that is tried to a jury in which the plaintiff makes a claim for compensatory damage and a claim for punitive or exemplatory damages, upon the motion of any party, the trial of the tort action shall be bifurcated as follows. The initial stage of the trial shall relate only to presentation of evidence and determination by a jury with respect to whether the plaintiff is entitled to recover compensation damages for injury or loss of person or property from the defendant. During the stage, no party to the tort action shall present and the court shall not permit a party to present evidence that relates solely to the issue of whether the plaintiff is entitled to recover punitive or exemplatory damages for the injury. If the 999 from Kathy Long Beach, CA, 990, um, hi Kurt, I'm a newbie. I've been enjoying your videos and live chats. Thank you. I've subscribed and liked every video. Your fans are awesome too. Looking forward to more content, 100, love us. Well, thank you. That's very, very kind, Kathy. I do appreciate it. Oberlin moved the trial court pursuant to this provision to bifurcate the trial into stages on the issues of compensation and punitive. Because Oberlin requested bifurcation and the statute was otherwise satisfied, bifurcation was mandatory. I mean, that's what it says. As noted above, this case proceeds to the jury upon a legal finding by the trial court. The actual statements in the flyer and the resolution, if false, constitute libel per se. At common law, Mouse was presumed in case of defamation per se, so a plaintiff did not have a burn to plead or prove damages. Decisions of the United States Supreme Court, including Gertz, later held the states could no longer presume damages 
to private defamation plan in the matter of public concern without showing a defendant published a statement with knowledge or reckless disregard of the truth. That would be the other half of like the public figure thing, if it's a matter of public concern. Thus, in Ohio, plants must prove either ordinary negligence and actual injury or actual malice. The parties agree at the commencement of the liability phase that malice was an element of the libel claims insofar as it pertained to presumption of damages on those claims, but nothing else. During the liability phase of the trial, without objection from any party, the jury was asked to determine whether Oberlin acted with malice in publishing the libel statements. The jury interrogatories also asked the jury to determine if each plaintiff proved by clear and convincing evidence whether the defendant acted with malice or negligence on each claim. Oberlin argues only that the malice issue having already been decided in the liability phase, so malice should not have been relitigated during the punitive damages phase. Uh, okay, I mean, I guess we could just take it as given, if you like. The parties agreed from the beginning of the trial that malice was an element of the libel claims and pertained directly to the request for compensation damages. The evidence and the jury findings were limited to whether Oberlin published a flyer and the Senate resolution with knowledge or reckless disregard. In enacting the tort reform provisions under the relevant law, the legislature granted either party the right to request the trial of liability be bifurcated or separated from punitive. As such, if a party requests bifurcation, and jury finds compensation in the liability phase, the court must hold a second stage of the trial to determine punitive damages since evidence of punitive cannot be presented in the liability phase. That'd be the nature of the bifurcation. The benefits to defendants are obvious because in an ordinary tort case, the jury is not potentially influenced in its liability determination by evidence of common law malice. Unfortunately, a defamation case does not fall neatly into the statutory framework. In fact, the, the Ohio Supreme Court only recently determined that non-economic defamation damages are covered by the law as a personal injury tort. As mentioned previously, the actual malice that needs to be proven in a defamation case is not the common law malice in a usual tort claim. Yeah, this is where the malice thing gets confused, right? Malice in normal tort land means, means hatred. Actual malice in defamation doesn't mean that, right? This is like an unfortunate reality of the term. Instead, actual malice that must be proven for actual punitive damages and defamation relates to whether it's published with knowledge or reckless disregard. That is constitutional malice. It gets even more convoluted in relation to whether the plaintiff is a private figure or public figure, and whether or not it's a matter of public concern or private concern. Here, the trial court ruled the Gibsons were private figures in a matter of public concern. So they only had to prove negligence and not actual malice. However, a finding of negligence alone, the Gibsons had to prove actual malice in order to produce, in order to recover compensation damages. The other avenue was to prove actual malice or that Oberlin published statements with knowing rec or reckless disregard. The relevant law provides that punitive damages can only begin after compensation. The Gibsons could have recovered compensation damages at trial in one of two ways, upon proof of actual damages or presumed damages upon finding of actual malice. The jury found Oberlin negligent and award actual damages to the Gibson. After the award of compensation damages, provides the jury shall then determine at the second stage whether punitive damages shall be awarded at well. I'm getting a little bit lost at this point, to be honest. On the other hand, if Oberlin had not requested bifurcation, the Gibsons could have put out their entire case at the liability stage on trial with evidence presented of both compensation and punitive. Without the request for bifurcation, the jury would not have had to look at actual malice for liability and then again for punitive. Because Oberlin did request bifurcation, however, after compensation damages were awarded, the Gibsons were entitled to proceed to the second stage of trial and put on any evidence they had pertaining to punitive damages for each of their claims. Defamation, intentional infliction, emotional distress, and tortious interference. The Gibsons cannot be punished for Oberlin's choice to bifurcate. So, okay, so basically that was a lot that was a lot of very technical stuff in that last part. Referring to all that. That was a lot of technical stuff, man. Because it's dealing with this aspect that's in Ohio law specifically, dealing with the separation of the trial phase and what has to be proven at each phase of trial. And then having to prove actual malice basically twice. 
but that was in the nature of what Oberlin wanted. So, you know, Oberlin can't really complain about it now because they wanted it in the first place. So, you know, the fact that the fact that um, Oberlin, the fact that the the uh, fact that the bakery basically had to prove twice that they were uh, actual malice. I mean, it's just kind of like, well, there you go. All right, so I'm going to skim through the rest of this. Um, because that is the main thrust of it. And how long, hold on, what page am I on? This is page, the bottom of page 31. And how long is this thing? Because I am a little bit tired. 49. It's 18 more pages. We'll try. We'll try. How y'all doing out there today? Doing good? 488 of you currently watching. It's appreciated. Thank you very much. We will go on to purported mistake number two. Excuse me. All right, so purported error number two for abuse of discretion denying the motion for a new trial. This sounds like it's going to be the same. Um, didn't properly define negligence. Appropriate standard, blah, 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 blah. Oberlin argues the trial court erred in denying its motion for a new trial based on exclusion of certain evidence. Specific details about what happened during the shoplifting incident and testimony about what Oberlin heard from members of the community about experiences at the bakery they believe to be racially discriminatory. Oberlin asserts that the exclusion of this evidence was prejudicial because the Gibsons were permitted to present evidence on these issues that were unfavorable to Oberlin, but Oberlin was not permitted to defend itself against the claims by, pre pre by presenting contradictory evidence. Okay. The admission or exclusion of relevant evidence rests within the sound discretion of the trial court. Therefore, Oberlin must demonstrate the trial court abused discretion in excluding the evidence. The term abuse of discretion implies that the court's attitude is unreasonable, arbitrary, or unconscionable. Both parties had attempted to present more evidence about the shoplifting incident, but the trial judge would not allow it and repeatedly remind counsel on both sides not to relitigate the criminal proceedings. Seems fair enough. It's kind of like an estoppel issue. It's like that that's already been determined, so that's over now, right? Throughout the lengthy trial, the trial judge refused to allow the parties to present evidence about the shoplifting incident, except that it happened. The students were arrested, the protests and alleged defamatory statements followed, and three students were eventually convicted. Consequently, very few details about the shoplifting incidents were admitted at trial, as is reflected in this court's brief discussion of the facts. As Oberlin has failed to demonstrate the exclusion of this evidence affected the parties differently or otherwise prejudiced the case, it has failed to demonstrate that it acted unreasonably. It's like, yeah, we're not. I'm not going to let you relitigate that case. All right, I'm just not going to let you do that. That happened. That's been determined. That's over now. I'm not going to let you argue that. I mean, it seems reasonable. Next, Oberlin argues the Gibsons were permitted to present evidence that they were not perceived as racist why Oberlin was permit, prohibited from presenting contrary evidence. The Gibsons presented the testimony of numerous witnesses who knew them, either as employees of the bakery, friends, or community members. Those witnesses testified about their own experiences with the Gibsons and the bakery and explained they had never witnessed any instance of racism or racial profiling. Oberlin, on the other hand, did not call witnesses to testify about their personal experiences with the Gibsons. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Instead, defendants sought to have Oberlin administrators testify about what Oberlin heard about the Gibsons from community members. 
Do we really need to read the rest of this paragraph to know why this is bad? Do we really? Do we really need to read the rest of the paragraph to understand what happened? The bakery had a bunch of people come in and testify about their personal experiences, about their personal interactions, and about what they personally observed in terms of the bakery being racist or not. That is what the bakery offered. The college offered our here are some things that we've heard. Now, I know you guys know all this. You know all this. Why was that not allowed? Why was the bakery not allowed, or apologize, why was the college not to say allowed to say, hey, here's some things we've heard from people about their racist experiences Uh, it's hearsay, 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 it's hearsay today, hearsay. <laughs> uh. Stephen Light, Kirk getting a second win here. Yeah, because of stupid. I'm getting a second win because of stupid. Oberlin, on the other hand, did not call witnesses to testify about their personal experiences with the Gibsons. Instead, the defendant sought to have Oberlin administrators testify about what Oberlin heard about Gibson from community members. Amen. Under the rules of evidence, hearsay is a statement offered by one other than the declarant while testifying at the trial, offered in evidence to prove the truth of the matter asserted. Oberlin does not argue these statements were not hearsay, or that they fell within an exception or an exception to the rules of admissibility. Oberlin excluded evidence was hearsay, while Gibson's evidence was not. Oberlin failed to demonstrate that the trial court abused its discretion by excluding the hearsay. Therefore, yeah, well, that, that, that's, a, that's a neat trick. That's a neat trick. I want to argue, I want to argue the trial court abused its discretion. I want to argue the trial court abused its discretion by forbidding me from offering all that wonderful, wonderful hearsay. So maybe that was why it was a little uneven. Maybe that was a little uneven. Hey, hey, wait a second. Why did the bakery get to offer all those witnesses that said that the bakery wasn't that the bakery wasn't racist, and why didn't they allow the things that we had heard that said that they were? That's unfair. They didn't consider our evidence. It's hearsay, 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 hearsay today. Could it be the court didn't abuse its discretion by following the rules of evidence? A winner is you. AD says $5. Did Oberlin try to argue the rules of evidence were white rules? I don't know. But uh, that's what's going on. Yeah. I just realized hearsay because you hear it and then you say it. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah. I have speculation and conjecture. Those are kinds of evidence. Yeah. That's one you guys could get wrong. Or you, that's the one you guys could get right. I mean, yeah. Compensation damage. The court will next argue, address Oberlin's argument the trial court should have re remitted the damages further. Courts have inherent authority to order remitter, remitters to reduce jury awards when they determine the amount to be excessive. Fair enough. They sure do. I mean, if the amount is wrong, they, they can be like, no. That's no. This court reviews a trial court's decision to deny the reduction for an abuse of discretion. Oberlin argues that even applying damages caps, the award is still exor exorbitant. 
It argues there was no witness testimony as to any losses caused by the flyer resolution. It argues that any economic loss caused by the alleged hostile environment created by the protest was merely speculative, including belief the harm would continue for 30 years. Wayne gives me Australian 799, Kyle Kurth not being charged for shooting Chad Reed. Wow. I mean, yeah, I agree. That's a little bit strange just because of how easy it is to indict people. But yeah. The Gibsons argue they present sufficient evidence of damage as well as the fact that it flowed from the Torses' conduct. The Gibsons called a certified public accountant with 35 years of experience to testify about economic harm. He testified that he had a professional designation as a certified valuation analysis, and experience and training enabled him to give a professional opinion on economic losses proximately caused by the actions. He divided the damages into three categories, lost profits for the bakery, lost rental income, and lost rental opportunities. For lost profits to the bakery, he reviewed the Gibson's tax returns, general ledger, and other financial statements. He also visited the site of the bakery, interviewed the Gibson's, and reviewed the Gibson's depositions. He then applied professional guidelines to compute the lost profits. He explained the reasons he projected the losses out 30 years is that the bakery dates to 1885, which puts it in terms of the top 1% of all businesses in terms of longevity. Uh, yeah. He also considers the taint of being labeled a racist business was unlikely to be overcome until at least a generation had passed. For the lost rental income, he looked at the decline in rental income that Gibson's experienced after the events and the long time it would take to overcome the accusations of being racist. Finally, for lost rental opportunities, he looked at the business plan the Gibsons had for constructing additional rental properties that would have been had to be delayed or abandoned because of the reduced cash flow. Where regarding causation, the accountant testified that a multitude of things affecting the business, including the protests and resolution, but he opined that it was Oberlin who caused the loss. Well, I mean, that sounds sufficiently reasonable to my mind. I mean, like, how are you, how are you projecting 30 years of losses is a perfectly reasonable question. Like, you know, Oberlin's initial, uh, Oberlin's initial argument, Oberlin's Initial argument of, geez, this is 30 years of speculation. Where the hell are you pulling that out of your ass? Is a pretty reasonable objection. Unfortunately for Oberlin, the response is also pretty reasonable. Hi, I'm a certified accountant. I deal with valuations. This is what I do. This business has been around for a shit long time. It's in the top 1% of businesses in terms of their longevity. So it's been around forever. So I'm able to use the records from, you know, the forever to, to make projections about their business going into the future, including, you know, business plans and stuff based on the things and based on the numbers. And that's how I computed the 30 years. And you're like, oh, oh, okay. Uh, that makes sense. All right. I, I'm sold. Uh, yeah, that'll work. The Gibson's also had a professor of marketing who focuses on consumer behavior with 25 years of experience. Addressing negative word of mouth, she testified that such communications have much greater effect than positive word of mouth and twice the effect on revenue. This, I believe. She also testified it's much harder to counteract negative word of mouth, supporting the account's opinion about the lasting effects of Oberlin labeling of the Gibson's on its business. Upon review of the record, we conclude the economic loss caused by Oberlin's conduct was not speculative. In, in light of these experts, I mean, I'm kind of inclined to agree. I mean, Oberlin's initial objection of how are you doing this for 30 years? And then it's like, oh, this is how. I'm like, okay. Yeah. We can also not say the jury lost its way when it chose to believe the testimony they counted about the amount of the damages. Y yeah. Oberlin next assesses that non-economic part of the damages should have been capped at $350,000 for each plaintiff instead of $350,000 for each claim. It does not develop an argument in support of this contention, however, except for citing part of the language of the relevant code. The appellant has the burden of determining error. It is the duty of the appellant, not the court, to demonstrate the assigned error through argument. Accordingly, the court will not make the argument for Oberlin. That's just accusing them, that's just accusing the attorneys of being lazy. This is accusing you of being lazy. 
It's like you said it should be $350,000 per plaintiff instead of per claim. And all you did was cite it. And we're not going to make your argument for you. So go away. Stephen Light says only a college could presume a CPA would have no way of valuing a business. Yeah, especially this one, you know. <laughs> punitive damages. Oberlin next argues that punitive damages award must be capped at twice the amount of the cap compensation damages instead of twice the amount the jury initially awarded as compensation. The Gibsons argue that the code is clear that punitive damages are capped at two times the amount awarded by the jury and the total is not affected by statutory caps on, on compensation damages. So that's an interesting legal aspect. So, I mean, I don't know. It could be written either way, right? So that's that's just a question of law in terms of how Ohio wrote its damages law. So the amount of compensation is capped, apparently. Really? Apparently. Oh, it's in non-economic parts of damages. Oh, okay. Still. So the non-economic parts of damages for compensation are capped at $350,000. And then, but the question is, when the jury award, awarded the initial verdict, which however much it was, and punitives, can punitive, are punitives two times that or two times the cap? Which is a pretty big difference. Under the revised code, the AD gives $2 and says $100,000 education to be stupider equals Oberlin College. I, I'd, like to, I'd like to congratulate you all that you are now all smarter than an Oberlin College professor. So you should feel good about yourself. Or not, because it's a low standard, but you know, we're, we're trying. Okay, according to Oberlin, the amount recoverable under the statute embraces caps on recovery established by the law. Specifically, the law provides a relevant part. In no event shall judgment for compensatory damages for non-economic losses exceed the maximum recoverable amount that represents damages for non-economic loss as provided by law. The plain language sets the cap on punitive damages in a jury case at two times the amount of compensation damages determined pursuant to law. The statute does not contain any language capping the award based on the maximum recoverable award. Instead, the relevant law directs the court to have a jury return a jury general verdict, and if it's for the plaintiff, to have the jury answer in an interrogatory that specifies the amount recoverable from each defendant. There is no language limiting a jury's general verdict to the amounts recoverable under the statute. Yeah, so like they don't tell the jury the amount to be limited. It's just limited by statute, but they don't tell the jury that. So if the jury awards them more, they just cap it down, but they still can base it off what the jury said. So yeah, we conclude the trial court did not err when it capped the punitive damages award at twice, the jury's uncapped compensation award. I mean, that's just a straight issue of law. And I mean, I don't know what the right answer is. I don't know what the right answer is. That's just a straight issue of law in terms of how it's to be properly interpreted. The Court of Appeals says it's to be properly interpreted that way, but I don't know whether or not that's the right answer or not. So maybe there's an appellable, appealable issue there, which would reduce the damages dramatically. So Oberlin has a lot of incentives to appeal, but the Court of Appeals isn't having any of it. So maybe the Supreme Court of Ohio wants to have a word, but you know, we'll see. How's my blood sugar? What a strange question. What a very strange question, Joseph. My blood sugar is fine. I don't understand this question at all. I had a great workout. I did some elliptical. I did a I did a uh, did a mile on the elliptical, which kicked my ass a little bit because I'm out of practice, and it reminded me that I need some more cardio in my life. But uh, you know, and then I did some. Uh, I did some lifting today. I did some shoulder press and I did some uh, machine, well, more cable bicep curl. And I did a uh, this tricep extension thing. It's like this, this gesture with a cable. And then I did uh, Palov presses. So that was my workout today. I feel feel good.
Okay. In his third assignment of error, Oberlin argues the court should vacate the enhancement that was added to the attorney's fee lodestar. And then the lodestar, as they note, is just the is like the the general rate to pay attorneys. And that's what the lodestar is, right? The general rate that lawyers should be paid. Uh yeah, I need more. I need way more cardio. So here, my for those of you, for those of you following my workouts, I'm doing my workouts on Instagram. Um, my my current intentions is to do a little bit. Is to do. I haven't been doing really any cardio at all, um, and I've been trying to do a lot more lifting. And I haven't been as regular because my body is not as adaptable as it used to be, or I'm out more out of shape. So my current working plan is to try to do more cardio, try to go more days of the week. So. Follow me on Instagram and you too can follow my plans. Um, and as for right, as someone mentioned right of reply. I don't know what his problem is. Is this a Uh, and Phoenix Lighting, the Supreme Court of Ohio noted its decisions regarding reasonable attorney's fees have been guided over time by decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court. The court explained determining regarding reasonable attorney's fees usually begins with the lodestar. That's sort of the just typical amount. You know, you take it's it's how much how much an attorney of that kind of at practice experience should be paid. So it's like a default number. Yeah, was it six million in lawyers fees? I thought it might be the six million in lawyers fee. So they won forty-one million dollars, reduced to twenty-five, and then six million. Yeah, I thought that was right, and then I was like, I'm not so sure if that was right or not. But yeah, that's what I thought. Um, the the is also explained in prior cases had held the load start could be adjusted adjusted up or down after applying factors ad ad identified in various rules the court recognized however the supreme court has more recently backed away from enhancements because of many of the factors supporting adjustment were already accounted for in the initial lodestar okay so i'll skip all that the gibsons argue they should be awarded the lodestar with a two or three multiplier enhancement okay initially they argued that the lodestar of four million eight hundred fifty five thousand eight hundred fifty six dollars was appropriate that's a lot of money I'm just, I mean, that's a lot of money. The Gibsons know the complexity and magnitude of the case, the five-week trial with just another week arguing motions, 33 witness, witnesses called, the contentiousness and complexity of discovery and pretrial, hundreds of thousands of documents exchanged and numerous pretrial motions. The Gibsons also know that many of the hours their attorneys spent on the case were because of Oberlin's actions, such as 32 depositions that Oberlin took, some of which lasted up to five days, Five days for a deposition? That's insane. How do you get that? How do you get permission to do a five day deposition? Further, the Gibsons indicated that Oberlin had also filed 17 motions and 16 motions in limine. The Gibsons also argued hourly rates charged by their attorneys and attorney staff were permissible. Regarding enhancements of the Lodestar, the Gibsons argued the case was time and labor intensive involving complex, substantive and procedural issues that were intertwined among the plaintiffs, preclude the attorneys from taking other work, involved a substantial amount of money, was justified by the results, required substantial expert and ability, and was accepted on a contingency fee basis, it was accepted on a contingency fee basis that equated to $10 million in attorney's fees. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, that would, that's about right. Yeah, that, that that's that is about right. I mean, yeah, that's about ten million dollars in attorney's fees. Y yeah. Oberlin, on the other hand, argued the lodestar was unreasonable. The enhancement factors were already part of the lodestar, and the enhancement should be reserved for rare and exceptional circumstances. In awarding the attorney's fees, excuse me. Excuse me. In awarding the attorney's fees. The trial court employed a two-step method. Regarding the Lodestar, it found the reasonable hourly rates in the community, given the complexity of issues and the attorneys experiencing the case, was $290 per hour. Sounds pretty reasonable. 
The trial court did not have any concern with the number of hours spent on the case and determined it was not possible to separate the time attorneys had spent on recoverable punitive damages claim versus a non-recoverable punitive damages claim. The trial court there found, therefore found that 14,417 hours Gibson's counsel spent on the case was reasonable. Fourteen thousand four hundred and seventeen hours, equating to a lodestar of four point two million dollars at two hundred ninety dollars an hour. Two hundred ninety dollars an hour. Two hundred ninety dollars an hour added up to $4.2 million. I mean, all right. As an enhancement to the load store, the trial court examined factors outlined in the rules. It considered Oberlin's argument that these factors were subsumed in the load star. However, regarding time and labor involved, the novelty and difficulty of the issues and skill to be performed, the trial court found the factor was not entirely subsumed by the extraordinary challenges faced by the Gibsons. The trial court concluded, although the experience, reputation, and ability of the Gibsons' attorneys was part of the Lodestar, when considered with other factors such as fee, customarily charged in the locality, the amounts in this case, the results obtained, and whether the fee was fixed or contingent, a multiplier of one and a half was appropriate. It therefore awarded $6.3 million in attorney's fees. That is a lot of... That's a lot of, man, that's a lot of, that's seven years of billable time. Yeah, it is seven years of billable time. Yeah. It's a little bit more than that. Like eight years of billable. No, it's, it's like, yeah, that's, that's a lot of, yeah, 17,000 hours. I mean, 2,000 hours in a year, and you can't build 2,000 hours a year. No one builds 2,000 hours a year. But 2,000 2, hours is like, you know, 2,080 is the amount of work is, is 52 times 40 is uh is uh 2080 and so 2000 is a more realistic number and then from there you think that a reasonable like an attorney to bill i mean turning to bill 2000 hours is not like completely unheard of but you know because attorneys will work more than that but i mean two, that's a lot of time man <laughs> How much do I charge? Not enough, man. I'll tell you what. <laughs> big Law does 2,000. You might get to 2,000 in Big Law. You might get 2,000 in Big Law. 2,100 hours in Big Law. You might be able to get that much, but... In the cross appeal, Gibson's and signed error, the trial court should not place the cap on punitive damages. They argue the cap of twice the compensation is unconstitutional as applied to these facts because it does not allow punitive damages to accomplish their purposes. They argue that punitive damages violate due process and the right to trial by jury. Good luck. The Gibsons note the jury initially awarded them $11 million in compensation damages and $33 million in punitive damages. They assert the jury's punitive damages award represents less than 3% of Oberlin's assets. Nothing that the, noting that the purpose of punitive damages is appropriately punish and deter, the Gibsons argue that purely mathematical applications caps thwart this purpose. Well, yeah, that's not going to fly. Yeah, so not so much. So, yeah. 
So they get what was it? They get $25 million. They get $25 million in compensation and, and punitives and $6 million in attorney's fees. I guess they still owe their attorneys $4 million though. So, I mean, but at least some of it's paid for. You know? I think, yeah, because like they did on contingency fee. So I would think, I would think that they're still on the hook for their $4 million, I would think. But uh, yeah, so Oberlin has to pay. Well, my friends, that is all there is for tonight. That was a lot. Um, we will continue on with more stuff in the future. But yeah, Oberlin's got to pay uh, some money. And apparently Oberlin has, this is like only, this Ober, Oberlin, this is only like a very small fraction of their amount that they have. But, uh, you know, I still have to pay them. So write a check, I guess. So I guess I'm gonna sign off for now uh, because that's all for now. If you've enjoyed this, please remember to give it a like, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already subscribed. If it's red, you should hit it so that it'll stop being red. Red is your clue to hit the button so that you know it'll it'll say it. And then you know join to become an uncivilian. I'm gonna sign off for now. I hope all's well. Till later, my friends. Cheers and good night.